Hey everyone, this is Michael Cole from Everflow. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, today we're doing a fireside chat with uh, Michael Celery. Uh, Michael, can you give a quick introduction about yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm an e-commerce junkie. Um, the 30 second version is that I started e-commerce companies and like helped friends start e-commerce companies back out of high school. Um, and then I eventually freaked out because I didn't have a real job, right? That wasn't a, that wasn't a, a proper occupation back then. And, uh, tried the real job, didn't like the real job, came back to doing e com stuff back in 09, which the bottom had just fallen out then. And it was just me and a computer. And I very quickly realized, wow, hold on. I have zero overhead in this business. I can help merchants scale with almost zero overhead in their business. This can be a lifestyle business. Um, hired people grew, hired people grew, got in uh, to be one of the top producers in the Magento um, space in terms of high tech stuff switched over to Shopify being our main focus, added some practice areas, and now we're a full digital agency. So in like the very early days, like how did you actually get traffic like in the door? <laughs> For us? Yeah. Well, I'm ashamed to say that I, 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 I uh, because I was a freelancer, mm -hmm. but my team was kind of growing. I was like in between an agency and a freelancer. I think nowadays they call those um, collectives or something. Um, but I would be on like, I guess it was called Odesk. Odesk, Upwork, one of those freelancer sites and like posing as a freelancer and then starting conversations with people and then eventually being like, oh, I, don't, I, I don't think you can afford us. And <laughs> that type of slightly passive aggressive pitch irritates some people, but some people are like, what are you talking about? Of course I can afford you and it turned <laughs> into a, to a pitch. So, you know, it's like really scrappy, guerrilla style. We, um, it was all like, um, I'd, I'd sort of tapped out with all of my friends' businesses because I remember this one time I was in Minnesota and we, my wife and I were out there for some conference or something, came back and I, I was just like, all right, I'd worked at my, um, my moxie to tell one of my friends, like, I'm sorry, but I can't work for uh, $14 an hour anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was, it was, you know, terrible conversation, right? Oh, Cause it was a friend. So I learned, okay, don't work with your friends. Um, so yeah. Did that answer your question at all? Yeah. Yeah. It's still always work with some how people like, because I think that like that initial growth is always the hardest part, whether it's for like e-commerce stores starting off, like how they get that initial traction. And oh work, yeah. Like a challenge. And it was like, terrible. Agency side too. Like most agencies grow through referrals, but like that doesn't help you in the very beginning. It doesn't. And the funny thing was it took us a freakishly long amount of time to get to the point where we were a good enough <laughs> that people would want to refer us <laughs> and b that people, so there's a weird thing with referrals when you're a service agency uh, or ser service organization. Some people want to like be protective and like if you're really good, they don't want to refer you. Mm -hmm. They know they might lose bandwidth or you might raise your rates if you had more clients. Um, so you have to kind of, I don't know, we had to get to a certain point where finally people were willing to <laughs> properly refer us. Yeah, we've we run into that a little bit with a few clients like, no, you're our secret weapon. <laughs> our secret weapon, I don't want to share about you, yeah. We're, we're like real life friends <laughs> yeah. and yet you're still like, no, <laughs> Yeah, what's I won't refer that? you. I, I don't want competition. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So, um, like you say that you're an e-commerce junkie, like what, what was like the very beginning of that? Like <laughs> what got you into it? What, like, what were you actually doing in the very, very early days when you were still a kid? When I was still a kid, I sold frogs to people in front of Walmart on Mother's Day. Like we had this pond mm -hmm. with frogs in it and I would collect them and like sell them to people. And, and why would people buy them? Because it's a frog. It's in a cup. It's cool. You know, you can play with it in your <laughs> sink. So it was odd folks that would buy, you know, but just doing like weird stuff like that or like I'd make these really cool rubber band guns or... Mm -hmm. You know, just as a kid, I was like trying every single, my, my family wasn't, wasn't wealthy or anything. So we were trying to like try every angle, you know? <laughs> um, and I think it must've been when I was a late teenager and I had been doing some roofing. My mm -hmm. dad had, uh, I was homeschooled actually, which the education was actually fairly good, but the life experience was incredible. 
mm-hmm. because th- basically my parents were like, all right, now you got to go and work for free for a bunch of people <laughs> <laughs> while I was in high school. So I was all bummed out, but tried like 10, 15 different trades, found some things I liked and didn't like. I just remember this one time doing roofing in the hot California sun with concrete tiles and going like, all right, I know this is not what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, it's a pretty good reason to uh, go. So that to doesn't have anything to do with e-commerce, but oh, my, my uh, now brother-in-law story there. Um, he, he brought me in back when uh, OS, uh, what was it? OS Commerce? Storefront. I think there was a platform called Storefront. Mm-hmm. Am I remembering this right? He's going he's gonna to chew me out if I get this wrong. Uh, Anyways, there's an old ASP.NET platform that um, my now brother-in-law had found and then started working on, and he was super smart and off the charts intelligent. Um, so he brought me in and started training me in some stuff. And, and I was trying to go more of the artistic direction. I was mm-hmm. into video production. I wanted to be a professional musician and all this stuff. But I had gotten into Photoshop and done hundreds and hundreds of hours of training on Photoshop, so I was really good at that. And he wanted me to go like more programming, but I mm-hmm. wanted to do the creative stuff. So. I had that happen a few times as a teenager going into twenties where I really wanted to be like this type of a person, but I was naturally gifted over here. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to realize for some reason, no, that's not a good fit. Happened like three, four, five times. Anyways, eventually I accepted, okay, I'm a tech guy. (laughs) I do really well with that. So, all right, I'll just lean into that. And that was the, the origin story of getting into e-commerce and everything. Yeah, kind of like, okay, I like Photoshop. I just want to design like cool stuff, but uh, e-commerce is just like so much easier for me. Okay, actually, this is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Wow, people can make a whole business with just literally a computer. I remember my goal back then was like to be an ultra minimalist. So I was like trying to install an SSH <laughs> client on my phone so I could just like only have a phone and not even a computer. Um, <laughs> I didn't even have an internet connection at one time. All I had was like a laptop and tethering to my 3G phone. Um, <laughs> For some reason <laughs> yeah cool so uh let, let's dive into some questions so sure. uh definitely with like COVID and everything like one of the craziest things about it is how dramatically e-commerce has accelerated in the last six months mm-hmm. like what is your perspective on what is driving this so COVID, which i would define as starting in the us at least for our clients in mid-march uh we tracked what happened every two weeks for mm-hmm. over a month just to see like who were the winners and the losers, what seemed to be happening, what was the perceived psychology. Um, and we learned some interesting things like one coffee went up mm-hmm. <laughs> and it just kept skyrocketing. Like it never <laughs> went down. Um, two, uh, like footwear, anything that you could do at home by yourself, it's totally skyrocketed and then eventually came down. Um, and then obviously like a lot of industries were in the toilet. Mm-hmm. So, I think after that sort of first impact or major blow, which will maybe fast forward into late April, uh, May, June, somewhere in there, the things that people wanted now that they knew the way COVID was going to be, those industries started picking back up actually quite quickly D to C wise. Mm -hmm. And our explanation at this point is D to C has grown like 400% in some industries recently. Yeah. Even in some of those ones that initially just completely tanked, like yeah. apparel, for example, some of our apparel and fashion clients have just gone way down. Others have just skyrocketed like crazy. So, and we'll get into this maybe on the tactic side a little later, but our theory at this point is like, okay, most people were probably doing some e-commerce, mm-hmm. but as a result of COVID, like literally everybody was just doing e-commerce for the majority of their purchases, including, and this is the key thing, like a lot of people that didn't even like it or had never really wanted to do that or hadn't wanted to use their credit card online or basically like late adopters. Mm-hmm. Now all every single one of those late adopters is in the mix and it's not likely they'll go back. Yeah. And I think it makes a huge difference that like there's a lot of products where you used to buy it from like a grocery store or anything and you had to actually buy it directly from the like producer and it makes a big difference. Like once you get used to that and you realize like, Hey, it's actually more affordable for me to just go straight to the producer. Like I mean, you- even for me, like I found myself doing that and I'm an e-commerce guy. Like there yeah. were a few things where I was like, Oh, it's just easier to go to the store and get it. And then, you know, there's like that last sort of like 
hurdle to actually doing something after you've had the six or seven marketing touches and you're finally like, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've done that with coffee too, just cause coffee is like the perfect thing to get at home now because you're not walking to work, like you're not, or driving to work, you're like you're not being exposed to a ton of coffee shops. So it makes sense. You know what's funny? I think coffee is going to be one of those things that will come back strong in retail. Mm -hmm. And like coffee shops, obviously, but it's like almost now seen as a different thing. It's like, yeah. there's my coffee at home and my coffee shops. It's like mm -hmm. two different things that you, that you need both of them now, I think in people's minds. Yeah, I Maybe. definitely think you're right there. Cool. So solutions like Shopify and big commerce make it easy to launch a store, but mm -hmm. the growth depends on customer acquisition. In your view, what are the, the best performing players doing on the user acquisition side that's really working well? Yeah, so um, I would say we've seen two major categories of big winners, mm -hmm. right, three actually. One is sort of highly niche aligned players. Think of like Noble, it's a, like a primarily women's um, athletic, like a gym shoe company. Uh, they are sort of aligned towards certain niches that when they couldn't go to the gym basically, they just crushed it. You know, mm -hmm. people that maybe like, basically like these, these, these modern um, D to C brands, let's say mm -hmm. where they're kind of keyed into a certain vertical, which a lot of them are um, all those like cool, kitschy, even D to C brands, like, like a way or um, you know, all birds, those types of brands do mm -hmm. great at a time like COVID, right? Cause they're the winners in D to C. So when everybody's going and shopping for D to C, they're like right positioned to grab that based on their good niche alignment. The other um, categories of, of, I would say, uh, big winners would be folks that started being super progressive and taking interesting steps. So for example, Lululemon, like mm -hmm. are offering yoga classes or, or hymns starting to offer therapy or like really interesting, like a lot of players did some really super interesting things recently in customer acquisition, some examples in um, of some like top strategies that we see working now are like on the advertising side, we've noticed people starting to be much bolder with their testing. Um, for example, like a lot of brands that weren't doing multivariate testing on their ads have started to do that. There's now easier ways to, to test hundreds of, di of different variations of ads. Um, some great new tech coming out there, trying new channels. For example, people that were just on Facebook, now they're doing Instagram, like that's an obvious move or, or vice versa, or maybe they're on, um, like they haven't even tried Snap or Pinterest or, or you know, um, Smart TV or like, um, there's a lot of channels that can work really, really well. And, and those who've taken advantage of them in the last few months have done really, really well, I think. Mm -hmm. So like trying new channels and being smarter, smarter about the ones you're trying in terms of advertising. In terms mm -hmm. of email, like email continues to surprise me year after year that it's still around. It's such an ancient <laughs> thing, but it's not like, like one, one of the strategies we're seeing work well is not just having a single email that you subscribe from and then sending an email newsletter, even a segmented one, but instead really using the strategies of nurture messaging mm -hmm. to go like, oh, let's see, this person subscribed from this page, so let's put them in this, this segment and let's send them a quick nurture sequence about that. And then that, that potentially gets them ready to purchase or purchase the second time. Um, second purchase is something that's a hugely important thing that we've seen over the last year, year and a half, where if you can start to optimize for second purchase, you might win a customer for life. Like that's a key mm -hmm. barrier that people kind of tend to forget about. A um, couple other quick strategies, quick, just to round out the list. Affiliate for mm -hmm. many, many brands is way, way, way cheaper than advertising. And mm -hmm. so a lot of our clients are seeing like great, great results from affiliate. Um, and then this is, I think the most interesting part of the list for me, but trying things that other brands may take for granted won't work. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. the classic example would be like old strategies. Mm -hmm. Like for example, like direct mail, guess what? Nobody sends anything cool in direct mail anymore. And some brands are reporting like up to 28 times better responses than email. Like a lot of, for a lot of brands, email is <laughs> exceptional and imagine 28 times better than that. Or like an example would be out of home advertising. One of our clients, Paravel, a luggage brand, they did a, a really like a amazing rebrand last year and they timed it perfectly with some great out of home advertising. Totally did great for them. Another example, also in the luggage space away, 
you probably saw this, but like they had these like pet level out of home advertising they're doing where the pet can actually like sniff the poster and it's like a smell that the, the pet will like. Um, so it's like really smart strategies that folks kind of maybe haven't done or they haven't explored or sound old school. Mm -hmm. um, the most boring of all strategy that kind of often ends up at the bottom of the list as evidenced in this list is organic, <laughs> yep. like strong organic content. Nobody wants to invest in that. It's kind of like, a, Oh, I guess we have to do that. Organic is, is always going to be a winning strategy. It's always going to be expensive. It's always going to take time. And that's why it's such a great strategy because to quote Jeff Olson, successful people do what unsuccessful people don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Although it's interesting, like I've been like deep diving into like B2B, like SaaS marketing from like the CMOs and stuff of like big mm -hmm. tech companies and like almost all of them, like their number one channel is content, like creating tons of great content, getting it out there, et cetera. So it's funny that it's like, totally. Yeah. In B2B that's important because you have to actually like, have something to show your boss and you have to do a lot of education and comparison so it makes sense but it is funny that like with each different like audience and stuff like the approach like the order of those different strategies like gets reordered like they still remain just as important it's just which mm -hmm. one you do first and it, it definitely seems like from that side like content is always number one and i mean for any any brand that wants to be in business in two years like if you're not doing content, then all the, the only thing that's going to happen is your advertising performance is going to go down mm -hmm. and you're going to get more squeeze. Like you need a transition strategy. I'm getting ahead of myself, but, um, yeah, like organic is, I've been <laughs> personal story. I've been waiting to like, I turned off all of our organic content a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. Cause I wasn't, I wasn't happy with the quality of it. I wasn't happy with like what we were talking about. Just like it's turn hard. it all off and it's hard. Yeah. And, yeah. and you want to have a long-term story, but organic is something that really forces you as a brand, as a person, even to think about what do we stand for? What mm -hmm. are we really here? Are, are we actually trying to add value to the world? Um, Cause that comes out in organic content. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those <laughs> existential questions that can make you curl into a ball in the night. Uh, so I wanted to go back to one of the things that you mentioned. So you said that like the second purchase is like, one of the most important things to focus on mm -hmm. um, because if you get them for the second purchase, you often get them for life. Um, can you go a little bit into sort of like how you think about getting that actual second purchase? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Sure. So um, first of all, <laughs> there's sort of a key, if you think of it, um, revenue as sort of like a, uh, the, the water cycle or something, you've got sort of this, set of potential customers up here and then that flows into a river or something if you can bear with the analogy and then that there might be a dam there and they're the, like basically like the water can only go where it's free to flow right mm -hmm. so the way we think about it is all right if you're in business they always say sales solves every problem which is a great generalization but you go okay let's see we need some track or we need some awareness we need some traffic we need to drive from that traffic to like convincing somebody through some trust signals or whatever to actually buy. And then at that point, great. Now they're, they're an actual customer as opposed mm -hmm. to just being potential. Now, how do we go to that second purchase? So we always think in terms of these stages and I think everybody spends a lot of time thinking about that first part up to, up to that first purchase. So I just want to share that when I'm talking about second purchase, I'm assuming that we've already established sort of those first things. Mm -hmm. um, so second purchase, um, We have found that the nurture mechanisms that a lot of customers put in place are just still designed for first purchase. Um, and that for second purchase or anything that happens after first purchase, it's seen as like 90% plus of effort is put into this customer experience, creating an incredible customer experience of first purchase. And that the assumption is, if we attracted the right customer and we had good quality creative that matched between our ads and our site and we had the right trust signals and they bought and that we shipped on time and that they liked the unboxing experience and that they liked the product, that something magical will happen and that they'll just buy again <laughs> and that we can get them to do that by just promoting appropriately. So obviously like promotion staying in touch, things like that. But I find that 
there's this kind of untapped opportunity there within that lapse point, which will depend mm -hmm. on your industry and whatever, where you, that's a hot customer. Like maybe we don't want to try and sell them on something. We want to touch in with them in some meaningful ways. And so maybe thinking about like a B2B sale, like imagine if after you sell a new version of your software or something, mm -hmm. like, are you just going to ignore that customer? <laughs> No, like you're no, going to call them. You're going to make sure they're good. There's a whole onboarding thing. I'm sure that you're going to do like, there's a ton of stuff that you do mm -hmm. because that customer is so valuable to you. So I think mm -hmm. taking that same methodology um, and that comes out as content, <laughs> what's distributed based on what your entrance point was. Um, it takes the form maybe of a personal touch, a personal, like a actually handwritten card, which is easy to do with Shopify. Um, there's a whole, way you can just like automate that handwritten thing. Somebody else can do it for you. Um, maybe a phone call, you know, like there can be a way that you can have a actual personal discussion with that customer. And to mm -hmm. me, that's the, the best thing. Taylor Stitch did this really great program that one of my good friends um, established for them, um, Michael Laniac, where he basically like masterminded, how are they going to do this incredible um, coming alongside the customer experience after that first purchase? Mm -hmm. to make them feel valued and leading directly into um, it's basically like a, a modern upsell strategy, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Does that help yeah, at all? No, perfect sense. And I mean, like if you, you have a happy customer and then you're still giving them a great experience after that, that's what makes them evangelists. And like evangelists are the people that are going to spread your name, like say great things about you and give that sort of echo effect that generates a ton of like, viral sales and referrals and it's usually and what i find is depending on the industry but for the second purchase um sometimes it's important to after you make that sale just stop selling mm -hmm. for a certain amount of time like just like there's a lapse point within which you need to sell them there's also like a don't sell period in my opinion if you don't want to be like like a sorry to throw vistaprint under the bus but they kind of deserve it at points like Okay, you want to buy this? Great. We've talked to you into buying something. You've agreed to do it. Well, do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want to do this? No. Um, like there's a kind of a good point to stop selling for a little while and know what that point is before you start selling again. During mm -hmm. that time, you send them some content. You just like drop them a note. You just communicate that we value you as a person, not just because you have a wallet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think this fits well in with like the last couple of fireside chats we've had with like affiliate marketing, partner marketing stuff. Like it, at the end of the day, it boils down to like, how can you build relationships? And what's interesting on like both the B2C and B2B side, it's like, how do I build relationships and on like a large scale, like efficiently where like I'm both being personable and like creating communication without like breaking my team and making them spend all their time on it. So I think that there's always a interesting balancing act, but it all boils down to like building like valuable relationships and being a valued partner. I like just for me personally, for example, when we're starting a new program in our firm and we're not an e-commerce company, we're a services mm -hmm. organization. I like to lead that new program for a certain period of time and, and figure out like, what do people actually value? What do they care about? What are they not? Mm -hmm. And then we operationalize it meaning we turn it, break it down into steps, turn it into standard operating procedures, train people, automate it, build reporting, make accountability, whatever those things are. But it needs to retain those characteristics of like, actually, for example, like let's say that we were going to have an additional outreach point to a customer after they initially signed up. That would be something that would be very important to me to be like, all right, I'm going to do it for a little while, talk mm -hmm. to 10, 15, 100 people. And then, and then from there, Okay, now we can fully automate that while retaining 95% of the characteristics of that. It'll still look like it's coming from me. It can still escalate to me under certain circumstances, you know. And I think every company needs to do that. Every customer, if Amazon's proven anything to anybody at all, it's that you have to put the customer first, mm -hmm. which I think is hard for some companies to, to be okay with. And, and I'm okay, you know, saying like, you have to put the customer first in the macro context. Like, for example, mm -hmm. sometimes a customer doesn't know what they want. And you need to, as a brand, like go and figure out, like think about Apple. Mm -hmm. Apple doesn't ask anybody like, hey, do you like the design of our products? No, they, they go and they bring in a world-class designer like Johnny Ives. He goes and designs something that nobody's ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And then everybody likes it. Like I'm okay with that model. And for that reason, a lot of brands like don't have review stars or mm -hmm. they're, they're making a statement. They're saying we're leading the way. So I'm okay 
with brands being like, we know we're seeing the future. We represent the customer. We can see what the customer will want, go out, bring it. And the customer loves it. That's fine. But you know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, we need to be listening to our customers and like treating them as people. Yeah, for sure. And I think what you mentioned too, about like the approach of handling it yourself for like the first, like, 20 or 30 or something like it also just humps anyway because every time you send out that email you're forced to like look at it again you're like maybe i'll tweak it a bit here whereas Mm -hmm. like once you've turned it into an automated process like you might review it maybe once a month but you don't feel that pain to make sure that the email is like as clean and personable as possible so Mm -hmm. like doing it yourself makes a huge difference towards getting it to something that really resonates totally i mean a lot of this stuff is obvious i just you know i think it's it's good to think back to the basics sometimes oh for sure i mean there's a lot of stuff that is the basics but it's also like you there's like this is something that i mean sort of it's like a lot of this fireside chat and everything else is like there is like this huge gap between like i am starting off and like here's the knowledge for like that beginning starting and then the knowledge of like once you're in the middle of things you're busy on 10 different tasks like, what do you start prioritizing? And like a lot of times it is just actually going back to the basics and implementing them. But there's a very different perspective and challenge when you're already doing five other things and you already have some success. So I think that finding this expertise and knowledge is super helpful. I think the, the ability to say no is important in life and is especially important as a brand. Like a brand is a, is a, is a person as I think about it, right? Oh, one people have, yeah, sorry about that. No, no worries. A brand, especially for, for sort of for millennials and especially for Gen Z, like a brand is, is something, it's kind of like, you know how Star Wars, like Star Wars community wants so badly to own the intellectual property that George Lucas has created. Oh. And, and he doesn't really care or whatever. Like they're always fighting over this because... <laughs> this franchise essentially has become a part of people. Right. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I'm not saying that brands are like, just need to be not like they all need to be nonprofits or something. I'm just brands are now to the point where they're one of the biggest things that people can relate to in this kind of day and age of mm-hmm. social disconnectedness. Brands can provide a, a natural communities for people to, 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 to actually be supported by it in really deep ways. So, mm-hmm. and I think brands have a more and more important part in the, the social commentary and in like standing for things. And to me, what impresses me is when a brand does mean something mm-hmm. like, just like when you meet somebody and you're like, wow, that I'm going to remember that person. I, I actually want to be friends with that person. Or I, I don't even like that person, but I respect them because they stand for something. Mm-hmm. I'm okay with that. And I think brands should be willing to sort of, be quite clear and so for me that means two things one is a brand the strongest brands create movements and that's easy to see right or or they they find a movement and then they become a a voice or like assist that movement or something like that or they actually just freaking create a movement and that's Mm -hmm. usually where you see that strong founder story where they had this background and they did this thing in in africa or like their friend died or whatever it was and then boom, they've got this movement that people relate to. So that's the first thing. But the other thing is like more practically, brands know how to say no. Mm -hmm. And um, whenever you have more people being born into this world and or any other type of expanding market, you don't actually need a million strategies. You just need one or two strategy that's good. Mm -hmm. And you can go a really long way with that. So I'm a huge fan of this like tip of the spear approach where you go, okay, all right, we've got all these customers. Great. How do we niche down more? Mm-hmm. How do we get more specific? How do we challenge ourselves to, to, to talk more directly to our more, most important customer base and then really dial that in all the way? How do we cut things out of our product line that are distracting us? How do we, you know, like work fewer hours in the day? Microsoft did this great study where they found people on, um, at least at this one time during this retreat, or I can't mm-hmm. remember the full conditions, but like people who were time boxed, we're twice as effective, you know, and just like thinking of that way as a brand is so powerful in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. And it kind of leads me to like a thought I've had for a while, like that sort of like standing for something in community, like 
that's the thing that will always be the ad, like major advantage of like e-commerce startups and stuff because like once you're to a certain size like you really can't change what how the world thinks about you and like how you respond to the world whereas like an up-and-coming company can really have like this incredible experience mm -hmm. that makes people feel special and want to tell their friends about it and so like there will always be the opportunity for a new generation because you always have that like secret weapon that you can grow with I love what you said though. So well stated. Cool. So um, what is one major piece of insight about the e-commerce industry that you believe that most people don't know about? <laughs> Bandwagon. People in e-commerce for the most part follow the crowd. And I was thinking about this because it sounds bad, right? Like bandwagon. Oh, that's terrible. Well, Maybe it's not like, for example, the entire discipline of UX is mostly a codification of the bandwagon effect. Mm -hmm. UX is mostly like the better, <laughs> I'm going to characterize it. So this isn't quite right. And please don't feel um, any UX people don't attack me on this, but like <laughs> UX for at least for a really long time was all about like, what is the best way that we can have somebody navigate? And then everybody just copies that. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, especially on the technology side, like in e-commerce, it's all about like, all right, what is, what are all the other comp brands in our industry doing? Let's just do that, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that's good and bad because like, obviously if it's working for them, it might work for you though. Cool, good. But all too often I find that people are just copying because like without any further true thinking. And the problem with that is the most popular tech isn't always the best tech. In fact, um, e-commerce tech is like, strictly speaking, five to 10 years behind the general tech industry, hmm. which is like super painful for me as a technologist <laughs> to say, yeah. you know? How about you? How would you answer that question? Uh, uh, I mean, kind of echoing what you said, like, I think that, often the best lessons to learn are not any, like there's only so much you can learn from what your competition is doing because once you get into a box, everyone thinks in that box. And a lot of times like who you should really be learning from is like a different industry where there are like exemplars that are like growing like super quickly or doing something mm -hmm. really well. And then saying like, okay, what are they doing in their market for their audience? And how can I take that mm -hmm. concept and move it into my audience and my world? And so I do think that it's one of those things that it is that sort of like, don't let yourself get trapped in a box. And, and even if you see a successful competitor, don't think that they're doing everything right. Like you mm -hmm. want to see like what lessons you can take from it and what lessons you want to avoid from even your most successful direct competitors and then look beyond that. Totally. And it's those differences that characterize you in a cool way. And even if something's like technically different or quote unquote, not, not as good breaks a UX rule here and there. Huh, I don't like breaking UX rules. That could be great for your brand. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got a good friend of mine who, um, for a long, long, long time, he's, he's been like against being data driven, you know, mm -hmm. and it's a bit hyperbolic. Like I'm always like, come on, like that, that's too strong. Like we got to take into consideration data. He's like, Michael, every single time people say data driven, all they mean is like, reading out data and then making an immediate decision based on that without thinking about the long-term effects of that, you know, mm -hmm. and like basically ignoring all of the wisdom of marketing and branding disciplines. And like, we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great point. Like being data driven is one of the things that drives me nuts. Cause like <laughs> data is like a tool that you combine with everything to make good decisions. Uh, the, the best example of this is like a podcast that really stuck with me was an interview with um, Andrew Mason of Groupon. Oh, yeah. And Andrew was saying that like, one of his greatest regrets with Groupon was that they kept testing this idea of instead of having like one Groupon deal, they would actually do two Groupon deals. And every single time they tested this, it was without a question like way more effective. They massively increased sales, they had higher retention, everything looked good. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And eventually they were like, okay, we're going to do this. Like the data shows us. And like, that was sort of like the decline of Groupon because yes, in the short term that leads to engagement, but it killed what made Groupon special. Mm-hmm. That like, these deals were really exciting and people got excited about them. So it's even though individual they deal. Now, yeah. the thing that got people excited about Groupon was getting eroded by having more than one deal at a time. And it's a perfect example of like, the data can tell you one thing, but like, unless you're using like experience and client feedback mm-hmm. and combining all these other points of like feedback outside of the data, like you're not going to make like the right decision for the year down the line or two years down the line when the data no longer reflects what you're seeing now. I think there's a practical ramification of this, which is that um, any brand worth of salt will be doing A-B testing on a bunch yeah. of different things, but when you're calling your tests, like make sure that somebody who's been doing business for a long time is sitting in and is listening and is going like, that doesn't smell right. Like I just, something about that's not sitting right for me or Mm -hmm. that says yes. Like in your example, like, okay, the AB test on actual conversion conversion level was quite clear with the results that had no, no bearing on the prior step of acquisition or awareness or branding or like, all of those precursory steps that you have to have all of those before you can even get to the conversion. Mm -hmm. And even if we had a way of testing all that, we can't even possibly tell the long, long long-term year over year perception, sentiment, fuzzy stuff that data people don't like and kind of discount. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think Google is an interesting case where they follow the data too much. Right. Mm -hmm. Like they're just like, we don't care what something looks like. Let's have (laughs) somebody put their 20% time into a random product that may turn into something or may not. Mm -hmm. And then it's basically turned into like these things that some of them catch after a while, some of them don't. Um, Apple maybe isn't listening to the data enough. Like for example, hey, okay, fine, we'll make things cheaper, but only after like four years of overpriced iPhones or something. Mm -hmm. Um, Amazon is weird because they're like, let's make something horrible, like a (laughs) V1 and put it out to the entire world and then learn from that, make V2. But I think, I'm struggling to think of a good example of this as somebody who like takes data well, but doesn't just rely on the data. Like mm-hmm. who would you think of with that? That I don't know. Cause I think that that's something that like all the people that are doing it well, it's internal and it just works. And like, you never know if it works because they tested it or it works because they had someone who just came with this concept. Totally. Um, I was going to mention like one interesting, like sort of like tidbit is, uh, like one of these companies, it's like a, one of the up and coming like tech unicorns. Like they were saying that like they had their landing page that looked terrible and awful. And no matter what they split tested against it, it always crushed it always won. every single better version they did That's to the hilarious. point where like it took them like two years before they finally like took like the different messaging and design mo- moments of that like landing page and finally incorporate it into different segments where they were still having that segment still get something similar to that and other segments getting the more pretty versions. But I think that that's like the other side of like (laughs) where any experience and taste and everything can lead you astray is like sometimes something that's ugly and confusing is right for an audience because they're just looking to check off a few boxes and sign up and anything you add above that is going to distract them from that. So like you always need to balance these things too. It's never as simple as just like, this is the right thing and this is the wrong thing. So I, I, I like that- the term data informed, right? Like yeah. take Coca-Cola. Remember when they tried to improve their formula and they came with it up with the formula that for people who had never tasted Coca-Cola, yeah, tasted better. And then they rolled that out and everybody hated it. So they had to go with the worst formula that people liked. <laughs> like yeah. there is that familiarity concept even in the fast moving world of the internet. And and like the other thing is like like you're saying, like, the macro thinking versus the the short term thinking, uh, we find like in our A/B testing practice, for example, we'll go like, all right, we need to test this big thing like a new PDP or something. So we want to A/B test each little thing, and mm-hmm. then we also want to test all of them together, and then we want to like roll it out and do the inverse test and test backwards to what we had before, and then we may we may want to do that like three months later just to see like. Was that just weird? Was this like a seasonal thing and we really should go back to the way things were? And I don't know. There's just like, it's really, really hard still to optimize a business with all the little inputs and outputs. Um, Mm -hmm. 
And I guess if, if I could take a takeaway for me, it's like when you find something that works, don't take too much time worrying about like how much better it could be. You might, if you found something that works, it's working. Like mm-hmm. that's something to celebrate and that's something that your customers like. Mm-hmm. So can you improve on it? Yes. Can that cycle of improvement take the time that it takes in the, in the seasons of life and in the, in the life of a human being to actually make something better? Yes, probably it can. At least that's my no, optimistic no take on this. <laughs> any company has like 10, I mean, probably like hundreds of things they could be improving on too. So it's also like, does improving this page provide more value than say improving your purchase funnel or mm-hmm. making sure that like your informational pages are doing well. So like you're always giving, making a sacrifice by choosing to continue to focus on one thing. Mm-hmm. I love uh, Jeff Bezos's thing of like live towards minimizing regrets. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. doing that as a company, like, all right, a year from now, if we look back, what would we regret not doing? So some of our clients, they're, they care just, they, they, they mostly care about the way something looks. Mm-hmm. And that's because for their customers or for them as people, that's what they mainly think about, which that's totally great. Some of them only care about the data stuff. And like, oh, AB test this one, one, make it permanent. Um, and I feel like our challenge as an agency is to come alongside these folks and help them balance that perspective. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you're thinking a lot about the data. We need to think about our creative here. Um, you know, you're, you're only thinking about the way something uh, looks and feels. The metrics are important too. Like, I think we should try and raise revenue this year <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> you know. So. Cool. So um, let's see. What do you think are like the considerations for succeeding in the next like 12 to 18 months? Like what should e-commerce companies be thinking about? What should be their like priorities for the next like year that's going to like help them get to the next level of growth? Great question. I, I think about this a lot. I would say three things. Uh, One is now that Google has defaulted to mobile indexing and mm-hmm. is pushing very, very hard for a faster load time, like you have to have a fast website. Like it's not an option anymore. You just have to do it. And that there, there are like every news website ever. Anytime I visit a news website, I'm always amazed that it takes like a minute to load. Totally. <laughs> and then especially with e-commerce because that there's a lot more going on. So it's even slower. Right. Um, Google recently did released a new update to Lighthouse, which is like the way that they measure page performance. And they've been very thoughtful about like, what are those factors that go into fast loading? What actually matters? Mm -hmm. Um, And so like, to me, that's number one. Um, And for our our clients, they find that when they adopt like performance front end technology, their conversion rate goes up 50% or more. Like it's Mm -hmm. a big humongous thing. Um, And so like, it's such a big problem. We've been working on this from the agency side, but also we're, uh, we're working on making some like productized solutions that we're very excited about with that. Um, so that's number one, like performance is part of user experience too. So, right. Mm -hmm. Like when it's faster, it's better. And then that translates into conversion. Second thing I would say is creative actually. So moving from the tech to the creative side, Facebook has removed, for example, like a lot of the, the inputs that you can change in your advertising settings for your account. So one of the biggest things you can still impact is your creative. And I think they did that because they recognize that is what brands should be focusing on. So for us, what that means is that whenever possible, we encourage our clients to take, to completely own their content and their storytelling and like have that be a super strong core competency. Every single Interestingly, like every single top D to C brand that we work with that grows quickly owns their own content. Mm-hmm. Um, and so related to that, having the strong content play, but also be willing to do like programmatic automated testing of that creative against a bunch of different types of advertising and placements. And should we have model or should be lifestyle and like all that type of stuff you need to be doing for sure. Um, like 
just like CRO on your own website, when you change the button color, you can actually get a few percentage point lift on conversion rate. Mm -hmm. Same thing with your ad creative. Like a lot of companies just don't do that. And there's easy ways to do that now. And then the third thing is to reduce your reliance on advertising, which this one gets said a lot, but like advertising costs are going up. You're going to need to raise your conversion rate on your traffic that you have. But if to strategies like this organic content, like you can totally, sorry, I got to turn off this phone. It's going to ring here. Um, you know, in that start investing in those long tail strategies that aren't just advertising, you know, 12, 18 months is a, probably not quite long enough to do it, but you can make, make huge progress towards that. And on that, have you seen like clients having like a ton of success with going beyond traditional like SEO content, et cetera, towards like influencers or social and really making that into a major channel or is that sort of like just a nice to have? I love what you were just saying. I think this is an area of investigation for us. Mm -hmm. For us, a lot of it is like, all right, how do we mix content and commerce? How do we make the two support each other? Um, and also, how do we create these virtuous partnerships? Sort mm -hmm. of, you know, like one of my favorite strategies that brands some for some reason don't like doing very often is like partnering or like working together with another non-competitive company. Mm -hmm. it's so easy. You're sharing your audience. It's free. Like, yeah. And you can totally know do it. your product should be aligned with the same type of audience as their product. Yeah. And you're moving up the value chain. I mean, like it's such a great play. I, I feel like everybody should do more partnering. <laughs> yep. Yeah, totally agree. It's kind of surprising. It's not more common because I mean, what is like the secret of like YouTube stars? Like if you look at like any of the most yeah. popular YouTube stars, like all like half their videos are just referencing the other top YouTube mm -hmm. stars. Like it's that cross reference that gets each audience growing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, <laughs> if it works for like building like a following of like 10 million people, it's gotta be pretty good for an e-commerce company. Yeah. And I'm not sure why I wondered about this. I wondered why it ends up being something that doesn't happen. I, I would put that up with bandwagon as one of the, the big things that I think is like such a big fatal flaw in the industry right now. Mm -hmm. Cool. So one thing I'm personally like really fascinated, obsessed with is like when we implemented live chat on our, our platform, like mm -hmm. we've always had it on the internal side and like having internal like customer success chat support has always been like one of the most important features of Everflow. Like mm -hmm. not only does it let us answer questions from clients, but we get a ton of feedback so we know what questions they have. Mm -hmm. and people like really, really appreciate it. So like they spread the word of Everflow. They say that it's a great product because of that chat experience. And I've been seeing more and more e-commerce companies like adopt having that chat bot on their websites. But I, I think that it is like this killer advantage um, of just like being able to like actually speak with your customers and like understand what they're going through and what they want to learn or mm -hmm. discover about your product. Like what are your thoughts there? And have you seen like clients doing it well on your side? Yeah, definitely. So I feel like the, like, uh, <laughs> like VR and, you know, Bitcoin and all these other things like live chat, it was going to be so big mm -hmm. and it wasn't quite as big as we thought. Like all those people making chatbots, probably they're doing something else now, but mm -hmm. there's still definitely a, like that's a, a still a channel for sure, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so I find it interesting that it'd be something that, that um, I think it's something that brands should definitely try. I think for what we've noticed, it can be most effective when it is positioned at the places at which a customer is most likely to be asking questions. For example, mm -hmm. not on every single page, maybe on the PDP only or on certain PDPs as well as on the contact page and then maybe within the cart or like at certain particular places. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we've seen is interesting is when the chat can sort of be semi-automated. So not like fully automated, but like seed it, basically seed it properly so that somebody sees it and they can see like, you can answer a question that would probably provide them some value. Like, Hey, are you curious about this, this, or this, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, here's some top. <laughs> Like that could be 
sort of seed it into the chat and then that that's a great strategy and then it should always escalate to a real human agent whenever the you know automated uh question and answer or machine learning or whatever it is that you have there it, that once that taps out it should always go immediately to a real human agent mm -hmm. um one thing that i saw that was cool with live chat recently was uh you can actually have like in your you can have like a chat sort of like that start of the conversation in the menu mm -hmm. and visible. So it's like, you can see the categories, but then you can be like, here's some top questions. And then if you start interacting with that, it turns into a chat. To me, oh. that's a great, great concept. Yeah, I just think that it'll be really interesting. I, I feel like for like a fashion brand or something like that, like there's a lot of times where like, you just want to speak to a person to like confirm like, does this, like what style is this? like? Mm -hmm. Is this like made in America, et cetera? Like, I think there's a lot of these questions where like just speaking to a human person and getting like that one confirmation of a question is like the difference between you buying nothing, you buying like an $800 mm -hmm. like, dress or something. A lot of it is just a trust signal thing. It's just like, mm -hmm. regardless of what your question is, sometimes I, I use a chat with the company that I'm considering buying something from just yeah. to see how quickly they're going to respond, just to see like, are they with it? Like, do they care kind of a thing? Yeah. And I might just even like make up a question. <laughs> um, and I, I wonder if a lot of people are that way. Like we're, as humans, we have to trust. Like we can't exist without trusting. If you don't trust anything, you like, you can't even live. Like you're trusting all sorts of supply chains and um, people every single day of your life. But we tend to be as careful with our trust as, as we can reasonably be and that's a good thing probably keeps us alive and especially with brands i think now in this day and age when people find a brand they can trust mm -hmm. they are willing to share about it like it's actually gone up the the, yeah. the share willingness like the, the 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 difference between a like a brand you don't like and the brand that you do like it's probably bigger in most people's minds than it was five ten years ago I mean, I can, you can say that's also a problem that we've become more of like polarized on everything. But um, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Could be, yeah. yeah. Cool. So uh, we had a question from the audience um, yeah. about like progressive web apps um, mm -hmm. and you see them as a key part of like the experience provided by uh, e-commerce brands. Oh, yeah. So, um, so have this technology, progressive web apps. Um, you know, single page applications, uh, like modern architecture is yep. definitely a thing. I think that with progressive web apps, the challenge is that the, um, the top level software and hardware providers actually like things being a native mobile app as opposed to progressive web app. Mm -hmm. So they're actually slow to release full support for PWA functionality, even in this day and age, which is mm -hmm. crazy to me going back. 15 plus years, Steve Jobs actually predicted PWAs. He was mm -hmm. like, guys, it's crazy to have to do native mobile apps. Like we should just have really good websites. That's basically what a PWA is. So progressive web apps are important in terms of their ability to potentially shorten the, the like access point for a customer, um, especially if you're a retention business. Like you should definitely be incorporating some aspects of, of PWAs. Like for example, having a home screen icon, having um, definitely having push notifications, like all of those types of things. Part of PWAs that is less important for e-commerce is going to be the sort of like offline mode, right? Now where I go with that, because the reason is because you can't process an actual transaction without an internet connection. It's not currently mm -hmm. possible. Um, there are some things that firms like ours are doing to think about that problem and think about like, what does the future state of PWAs look like? Mm -hmm. I would say the key thing with PWAs is um, it's not actually terribly difficult to adopt. Um, it's not like this huge migration necessarily. Like PWAs, if you look into what actually goes into a PWA, it's actually more of a mindset and a methodology than it is a sort of major platform shift or something. Mm -hmm. That said, there are definitely players in the space now that are making it easier to adopt that technology. So I would suggest get informed about what, what actually matters PWA wise and headless wise. And then, you know, at that point, talk, talk to vendors, but it's like, I'm trying to think of an example, like, and do you have any recommendations of like how to get informed? 
Um, well, that people can reach out to me if you want. I've been following this stuff for years. Uh, my, my email is michael at celery.com. I love talking to people. Um, also, I think it's a pwa.dev set. I think that's the actual website for this. No, that's not right. PWA, hold on. Web.dev slash progressive dash web dash apps. Mm -hmm. um, and the key, okay, look, the key thing with PWAs is actually performance and user experience. So whether we're talking about headless architecture or PWA or single page application or modern JavaScript frameworks or, or Vue or React or Angular, whatever it is, it's really talking about the same thing, which is, Let's make our um, let's make our sites really really fast. Let's make them easy and smooth for people to browse, and let's increase the access points to them. That's the third thing. Mm -hmm. So I would say those three things that that's what you actually need to get to, and you can do that regardless of your technology stack. But I do think that PWA is one important access point into that. So like the tech that I mentioned that we're working on recently, um, where this is a huge focus of ours, as you might <laughs> might have guessed. Um, yeah, <laughs> good question. Cool. And uh, just to wrap this up, um, what's one takeaway you have for the audience about um, the future of e-commerce over the next couple of years? What should people be looking out for? It's the same thing. You need to have fast performance and you need to have great, great user experience. Um, and that starts at awareness, carries all the way through to unboxing. And then, as we said earlier, to the second purchase and then from there to your to your lifetime value Another question from the audience um, what do you think is uh, what do you think will be more important to grow uh, for like for growing e-commerce brands in the next two years influencers referrals or uh, customer referral programs influencers for sure without a doubt is there anything you're bullish on that side of like how it of like where people will go there so Influencers is, is, is still relatively untapped in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many influencers, the more niche you are, this is like going back to the whole niche play. The more you can niche down your business, the more influencers will love you because influencers have to be niche to get an audience, right? Mm -hmm. um, so your nanos and your micros, they're in my opinion, a huge untapped. Um, so what you're gonna see is there's gonna be more formalization between the worlds of affiliate and influencer. Those two worlds are gonna like combine completely. And that's gonna be great because the tech, like the tech that you guys have is fantastic for this. Um, it becomes really easy to automate that program, automate your influencer acquisition. There's actually an email, this is kind of cool. There's an email tool that I came across recently where instead of it just being like an email signup, when somebody plugs in their email, it looks at all their social prof profiles to figure out if it thinks they might be an influencer. Mm -hmm. And if they are, it's like, oh, hey, it looks like you might be an influencer. You mind if we reach out to you? So like little things like that that you can automate about your influencer program are going to be super important. That's awesome. And I want to just highlight uh, one of the points you made because I think that that's a super fascinating idea. The more that you niche your business towards like specific audiences, the better suited you are to find like influencers in that niche that are going to love what you do and promote you. Uh, I think that that's a, a very powerful uh, idea and it'll be really interesting to see like the wave of companies that really have that perfect, it's not like market fit. It's more like influencer fit where it's, they're so well suited to these influencers that like the two audiences perfectly overlap where like it just grows the company like a rocket ship. Yeah. I think you're, it's okay as a brand also to stand out like influencers respect a brand that, that maybe doesn't totally, it's not like them as a person, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, inf and influencers is, is a brand as well too. So we're going to see more and more influencers being choosy about who they work with. So that's why it's important to be somebody that they would want to work with. Yeah. Great point. So awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I think this is really wonderful. Um, do you have any uh, shout outs or parting comments as we wrap this up? Uh, just again, like, feel free to email me, michael at salary.com or um, our tech that we've been working on. It's called Nyla, N-Y-L-A, Nyla.hap. And uh, yeah, be happy to speak with people. Thank you so much for the time, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Have a wonderful day.